and the lecture is a part of a series of Vasil Nazarovich Karazin, Kharkiv National University project, a lecture to victory, world speakers in support of Karazin University. And this is the 11th initiative, I'm very proud to say, dear Center of Public Relations, thank you so much for your fantastic work and for being such an amazing source of inspiration and support for everyone. So dear audience, I'm very happy to step down in favor of the Dean of Philology, Evgenia Sergeyevna Chekhova, Professor Chekhova is with us today, a doctor of philology, the author of about 50 scientific and methodological papers. Professor Chekhova's interests include linguistics, classical philology, lexical and semantic system of ancient Greek and Latin. Professor Chekhova's major papers are related to the study of concepts of space and time on the material of ancient Greek language. Dear Evgenia Sergeyevna, it's a great honor to have you with us today. Please, the floor is all yours for words of greeting. We are very privileged and very grateful to you for being with us today. Shanovna Evgenia Sergeyevna, duzhe vdyachni vam za vašu prisutnost. Це велика честь для нас. Будь ласка, прошу, якщо дозволите вам слово. Thank you very much. Thank you for your words. Good afternoon, dear guests. First of all, dear Professor Felbaum, uh, the Karazin Kharkiv National University and the School of Philology in particular sincerely welcome you today at this meeting. And please accept our heartfelt words of gratitude for your agreement to speak today for scientists, teachers, students of our university. We are very interested to learn more about the results of your long, deep scientific work and to expand our research and educational boundaries. The Kharkiv University has its own research traditions in the field of general and applied linguistics. We have a specialized department in this direction of scientific knowledge. And today in our work, we try to combine the traditional and the innovative in this extremely important uh, scientific field. Therefore, your lecture today is of great importance and of great interest for us. But what is more significant is the support you show by agreeing to speak for us today. In the conditions of war, we'll try to do our best in our workplaces. This is how we are approaching our victory and the growth of our state already in peacetime. Therefore, we really need the help of our colleagues. It inspires us and makes us stronger. So thank you once again, and welcome to the Kerasan University. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your finding. Thank you. Thank you, dear Evgenia Sergeyevna. Dear Christian, would you, would you permit, would you like to start? We would yes, be very happy. Yes. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Yes, I already mentioned that I'm I'm very honored to be with you and uh, uh, all my good thoughts are with you and I hope we keep in touch and uh, maybe meet in peacetime sometime. So, okay, let me start with my, um, um, let's see. Um, can you all see my screen? Can you see my screen? Uh, no. Not yet. No. Not yet. Um, sorry, sorry, not yet. Okay. Um, I have it, my. I can see it here, but um, it's your link, so maybe I'm not sure what to do. Um, Pani Victoria, może potrzebno coś technicznego dozwolite Pani Christian, żeby rozszarzyć ekran. Do uh, need to. Uh -huh. Na stoicie dozwolę, to to maja. Uh -huh. It's all allowed, yeah. It's all allowed. It's not allowed. It 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 is it is it is, it is allowed. But so if I show you, setting. if I go into this presenter view, can you see see this? Can you see this? Not yet. Not yet. Um, uh -huh. Maybe. Wow. I, uh, pani Victoria, czy możliwe zrobić pani Christian, powiedzmy tak, kierującym zoom linkom? Dear Christian, we will try to make you the co-host. Of the session. Okay. Yes. Okay. Please do that. That's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, 
let me see. Um, yeah, I'm the co-host. Okay, I can share my screen. You can right. try. You can try. Uh, yeah. Okay, let's see. Uh, I'm sharing my screen. Um, how is that? Wonderful. Yes, okay. yes, it okay. works. Very good. Yeah, of course it works. Everything works if we are patient. <laughs> okay, I will put in the presenter view and how it still works. Absolutely. Okay, wonderful. All right, so let me start. So let me say um, that uh, this is a fairly non-technical talk because I wasn't quite sure who the audience was, but I think even those of you who are familiar with this project that I will talk about may not know so much about the background and the history of it and its relevance to psychology and um, uh, language and computer science and uh, cognitive science. Um, so I hope um, there's a little bit of interest for all of you from different um, uh, backgrounds. And of course, I'm very happy to um, answer any questions uh, at the end or if there's something that uh, comes up during the talk that is completely opaque, uh, please um, uh, put it in the chat. I cannot see the chat, but maybe Alina will be uh, alerting me if somebody has a serious question. Absolutely. Oh, okay, so let me start. Um, main thing, I, by the way, I'm getting a lot of people coming into the uh, room. Uh, am I admitting them? Can you admit them, Alina, or do I have to admit them? Yep. The, uh, our, our technical department, our, our Center okay. for Public Relations is doing that. They okay. are admitting right. everyone. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. All right, wonderful. So, all right. So, my main uh, topic will be uh, around a um, lexical, electronic lexical, lexical database that Alina already mentioned that I um, developed called WordNet. And as I mentioned earlier, I will talk about the linguistic foundations of this project and the cognitive science um, um, background and also some of the computational applications. Um, so first of all, um, just to define uh, the terms, and it's probably not necessary for you, <laughs> but um, by when I say the lexicon, I of course mean the vocabulary of a person's, of a speaker's language or of a language. Our mental lexicon, it's somewhat different. It's our representation, our mental representation of the meanings and the properties of the words of a language. And cognitive science, of course, is a little bit of a, you can think of as a Venn diagram um, defined between psychology, linguistics, computer science, and so forth. So this is going to be the scope of my talk. Oops, wait a minute, something happened here. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, in particular, um, in the WordNet project, we were interested in the speaker's knowledge of a word, which of course includes the form, the sound properties, the orthography, or for a sign language, the signs that the signer makes, um, the grammar of a word and the meaning. So all this is part of our mental lexicon and that all needs to be accounted for when we are trying to um, build a model of the mental lexicon. Uh, what is not in the lexicon is um, productive processes like compounds. Uh, these happen to be German words, which I picked up during the pandemic. German is my native language. Uh, the mask sale or the mask refusenik, somebody who doesn't want to wear a mask. Um, that does not belong in a lexicon because a speaker can use their knowledge uh, of the grammar to decompose these uh, composite expressions and analyze and understand them. Um, we also often don't have in the, we don't have in the lexicon of a given language what we call lexical gaps, words that don't exist in one language but may exist in another language. Um, we also um, know that in the lexicon we have what has sometimes be called covert categories, uh, namely concepts that do not have a word, but that the speaker clearly recognizes. So for example, in English, we don't have a word for wheeled vehicle, but we do have words like bus and car and truck. And on the other hand, uh, words like tra uh, tram and trolley and tram, tram, train, sorry, which distinguish uh, vehicles on wheels and vehicles on rails. Now, people may say, ha, how do you know this? Well, we know this from experiments. You can give people all these words and ask them to group them into different categories, depending on meaning. And people will put bus and car and truck together and tram and trolley and train together, showing that they distinguish these 
concepts that do not have words in English, wheeled vehicle versus vehicle on rails. Um, so this is an interesting area of research for psychology and psycholinguistics to see what categories are in speakers' minds that are in fact not expressed by words, but can be shown to exist. Um, here is something just fun. Um, <laughs> the Dean mentioned that you have to make a joke once in a while. So this is not a joke, but it may make you smile. Um, this is from a colleague uh, called John Old, who speaks Maori, which is the indigenous language of New Zealand. And he said, here are a bunch of words for Maori that uh, do not have a word in English or many languages that he's looked at. So for example, um, a person with six toes, we can of course say this, but in uh, Maori, there is a word for that. Or a twist the neck of a hen, or a feather worn in the ear or the nose, and so forth. So um, it is interesting to look at this cross linguistically and see what kind of um, categories are expressed or not expressed in a given language. So um, we assume that the structure of the, that the mental lexicon has a structure. It's not just a random list of words and concepts, uh, mappings, but rather that there is some uh, organization to it, uh, because it's just too big. We know tens of thousands of words. It's just too big to be a simple list, and uh, there has to be some uh, rational, some economic organization. Uh, we also know this, that um, when children learn languages or words, that they assign them to categories. Um, so, for example, a child, that young child that grows up in the country and sees a goat and learns the word goat, and then they take the child in the city and it sees a dog, it will look at the dog and say goat, because it recognizes that there is a similarity and uh, that the dog, while the child doesn't know that word yet, belongs into the same category as a goat. So we can see that children do this all the time and acquire words and concepts with category, it should be via categories and category assignment. Uh, we also know from people who have strokes or traumas, a brain trauma and lose words, or suffer aphasia, that they lose their words or their concepts uh, not just randomly, but in patterns that often refer or denote an entire category. So for example, people with early dementia very typically uh, lose all the words for tools like hammer and scissor and so forth. Um, this has been shown many times. Um, we can also see when new words come into the language that these follow patterns. The words are not just random that come into the language, but they are patterned on existing words and modifying existing words in interesting ways. So the WordNet project, which is wondering about all these questions, uh, was started by my mentor, a very famous psychologist, George Miller, who's unfortunately not alive anymore, but he lived to ripe old age of 92 and played golf until the last day. Um, his original motivation was to create a tool for increasing literacy among children and make children interested in reading and make it fun for them. And he asked, how do children learn words in school? This is a subject that's taught in elementary school in the US. And it's called vocabulary development. What um, usually is done is that the kid is given a dictionary, is taught the word, is told to look up the new word in the dictionary, and then write a sentence showing that the child has learned the meaning of the word. word. Well, we tried that in an experiment and uh, it really didn't work very well. So for example, for the verb erode, which is not a very frequent word, but that the child was supposed to learn, the child looks in the dictionary and it says to eat out. And then the child says, wrote down the sentence, my family erodes a lot. And that's of course nonsense because erode refers to erosion of a rock on water, or that kind of eating out, not eating out in a restaurant. Um, so uh, George Miller said there must be a better way to construct a dictionary that is useful for children and for adults or foreign language learners to um, help them learn the meanings of words. So that's how the WordNet project uh, was uh, started or motivated. It also turned out that artificial intelligence, which we hear a lot about these days, uh, was already really hot in the 1970s and 1980s and cognitive science. This was a subject that people were really interested in. 
And AI's goal, of course, is to model human behavior computationally and pass the Turing. Uh, fool a machine into thinking that a computer is really a person. So uh, a tiny, tiny bit of history. There were three um, uh, in America, three uh, pioneers in cognitive science, um, George Miller, whom I mentioned, uh, Jerome Bruner, and the linguist Noam Chomsky. And they really started the discipline of cognitive science in 1956 in opposition to behaviorism, which said everything that humans do is in response to some stimulus. We are just automata who react automatically to something that we perceive. Um, but we don't have independent minds. To us, this seems like a completely crazy thought, but this was believed until about 1956. So um, cognitive science uh, was born then, and George Midler, my mentor, was one of the major um, pioneers. So back to WordNet. Um, what is WordNet? It's a large lexical database, or you could call it a semantic resource or electronic dictionary. Uh, it was developed here at Princeton, and it's still maintained, although I haven't worked on it now for some time. Uh, here is a link, and if you want to, you can look it up. There's a browser, and you can sort of roam around inside WordNet and see where you go from one word to the next. Uh, it's very large. It includes most, of never all, because always new words are coming into the language, but most English nouns, verbs, adjectives, and also adverbs. Um, now, when we built it, we said we have to put constraints on the model. We have to be strict. We can't just do anything. So what are our constraints? One is that it has to be the sort of linguistics, and it also has to be psychology and cognitive science. It has to be psychologically uh, valid or real. It has to be consistent with data from psychological experiments, where psychologists test the linguistic behavior uh, of people. It has to be universally applicable, at least for the most part. Of course, many words don't exist in all languages, but the core should or does. It should be testable. It should be elegant and simple, not complicated. And it should be amenable to comp computational applications. Now, WordNet has been used by many hundreds, if not thousands, of computational uh, linguists and computer scientists that work on natural language. So. That last part, um, I'm happy to say, uh, really has been fulfilled. And the other parts I will try to convince you of in what I say next. Now, we had several options. We could say, well, we can organize word nets uh, by sound. Uh, maybe people organize their mental lexicons by the way uh, words sound. Let's say the first consonant or the first vowel of a word. And there's evidence for that, for example, from speech errors. Um, when people say um, fresh fresh instead of fresh fish, where they invert the first consonants of each of the two words, an anticipatory error, uh, we can see that the two words are confused because they're similar in people's minds and you just make a small mistake going to the wrong one. So you might say, ah, people store words by their sounds in their minds. And that's not incorrect, but that doesn't cover the really interesting parts of how we organize words. Um, also, of course, we rhyme words and we know how to count the number of syllables and all that. But we decided against that. Um, and um, I'm going to skip over this a little bit because I'm otherwise I'm talking for hours and hours and I know you all want to have dinner. <laughs> but ask me questions if you want. So our view of the mental lexicon that we wanted to model with WordNet uh, was sort of like a library. You can think of a library with all these books, and most people organize their books by meaning, by some kind of context. So you put all your, let's say, detective novels on one shelf, and you put all your dictionaries on another shelf, and you put all your uh, academic uh, books on another shelf, and so forth. So you have some kind of organization that is usually by meaning or content in the case of books. But we sometimes make a mistake. We go to our bookshelves and we pull out the wrong book, either the one next to the one that we really mean to pull out or the one on the shelf above or on the shelf below. So we make mistakes. And it's very interesting to see what mistakes we make when we put, take words from our mental lexicon, words we intend to use, but we substitute unintentionally another word 
How similar is that other word? So as I already said, um, this often um, happens and can actually be measured and can actually be induced. People can be made to make mistakes um, through clever experimental trickery <laughs> in the laboratory. Um, so um, another possibility would have been a syntax-based organization to say we are looking at, we are organizing the verb, the, the, the noun lexicon or the verb lexicon by the syntactic properties. And there is some uh, evidence, notably Beth Levine from Stanford, who already oh, 30 years ago showed that the syntax of English verbs also reflects their meaning. So there's a strong correlation between meaning and uh, syntax. However, um, it's not possible to organize the entire English lexicon by syntax. So we decided against the syntactic-based organization as well. Not only did we rule out phonology, but also syntax. Um, and I'm skipping over these, but um, some of you may know this and you can certainly ask me later. So what we ended up doing was to say, we want to build WordNet or organize WordNet based around semantics, around meaning. Um, and uh, the relation, the, lex the model of the lexicon that WordNet follows can be called relational. Namely, words are related, interconnected to one another by meanings relation, meaning relations. And these relations hold the lexicon together. Um, so it's actually really a kind of structuralism, a very, very early form of more American linguistics and, and Eastern European linguistics, I must say, in the 1920s. Um, so it kind of looks like this. You don't have to read this. In fact, you shouldn't read this, but that's the idea. And again, the idea came from two researchers in, in psycholinguistic and cognitive science, Collins and Loftus. He said, we think the lexicon is organized like that. You enter into one space into this network, the big blue space in the middle, and then you have all these connections to other words. Sorry? You have all these connections to other words. Um, and the further away you get from the point where you enter, the weaker the connection is, the meaning relation. Um, so, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm hearing something. Is this a message for me or it's just back? Uh, could you, your colleague, could you mute your microphones, please? Oh, Dimitri, uh, you have a question or you are just, no? Okay, all right. Okay, all right. So here is a real example that you can read and should read. <laughs> of a semantic network. Um, let's suppose you, that's just the model, right? It's not yet WordNet, uh, just the idea. So let's suppose you have the word red in mind or you think of the word red. Uh, what comes to mind? Well, on the one hand, on the right, let's say you associate words like fire, red fire. And then from fire, you may go to house, but that's already a weaker link between house and red than between red and fire, right? You may also go to roses on the way down, red roses. This is something that's very closely connected, right? And then for those, you may go to violet and flowers. But again, the activation in your mind, the mental, the strength of the connection between red and violet uh, and flower is much weaker, if at all, than it is between red and roses. So the idea of the semantic network is that you have links, connectors, um, and the strength um, gets weaker the further you go away from the original word that you started out from. That's the intuition and the underlying idea. So WordNet was inspired by this model of Collins and Loftus. And as I said again, and I will point out later, it's consistent with experimental psycholinguistic experiments uh, pointing to human lexical organization. So uh, again, what's special about WordNet? Well, um, traditional paper dictionaries that we used to use years ago, and I certainly still used and even use now, uh, are organized alphabetically by spelling, by writing, because that necessarily has to be so, right? We need to look up an unfamiliar word. We know how it's spelled or how it's pronounced. That's how we look it up. But what, it, as a result, the words that are found together on the same page are not related by meaning. They're only similar in spelling. But WordNet is organized by meaning and doesn't care about spelling. So WordNet is organized by categorization of the kind that I already mentioned earlier, like the child's acquisition of the uh, word dog or uh, goat, whichever. 
Um, and it's based on the similarities among entities. That's what categorization is, right? So Frank Keel at Yale University, in fact, you might want to uh, look at his uh, work. He was the one who long ago showed that children categorize and that we all categorize, right? We all, when we hear a new word and learn its meaning, we assign it to another group of words that are similar. Um, categories also can be distinguished into seven levels of granularity. Elena Roche at Berkeley showed this a long time ago. Dear, dear colleagues, could, could you please mute your microphones? Pani Marina, wymknij, будь ласка. У мене написано медведь. Dear Christian, I apologize. Yeah, it's okay. Um, can everybody see or hear and or hear, I guess? Yes, yes. Thank you. Everybody? Okay, good. All right. So um, Elena Roche, who, again, whose work you might want to look into if you're interested in the early days of cognitive science and categorization, uh, pointed out that there are different levels. There's a superordinate, a high level, let's say fruit, for example, then a basic level like apple, banana, and orange, whatever fruits you eat. And then a subordinate level, a lower level with specific kinds of, let's say, apples. So in English, we have Granny Smith or Fuji or Stamen or many other kinds. Um, so um, this is something to keep in mind, the different levels of categorization. And um, we can now ask the question, um, how is all this organized in our minds? And how do we so know so quickly uh, what the category, what what properties the members of a certain category all must have. Well, here is another experiment that is inspired WordNet. Uh, it's um, only a toy experiment. They used very little data, but it's a very compelling experiment uh, by Collins and Quillian. And this is an, an illustration. They said, uh, we organize our knowledge of concepts and words into uh, different um, levels on a hierarchy. On the top of the level, we have something called animal. And then we have lower levels like bird and fish and canary kinds of birds and so forth. And the important point here is that uh, at each node, at each point, let's say animal, we store information, knowledge, uh, in salient properties of that concept only with that node. So with animal, we store the properties has skin, can move around, eats and breathes, nothing more. When we look at a, sub, a lower category, let's say fish, we store other properties like has fins, can swim, has gills, and so forth. And then if we go further down to salmon, we may store something like is pink or can be eaten and so forth. So the idea is that um, this is a very economic um, storage of um, knowledge about concepts because you only you inherit the properties from the level above so if i ask you does a salmon have skin uh, you don't look up in your mental lexicon what you know about salmon but what you do is you go up to the fact that salmon is a fish and a fish is an animal and then you find the property has skin and then you can say yes or you know a salmon has skin. So it's the inheritance uh, of properties that is represented in the hierarchy that makes our knowledge structure and knowledge that we all possess of words and concepts very efficient. Now, that's a beautiful idea, but does it work? Well, um, uh, Collins and Quillian, here's what I just explained, um, uh, carried out an experiment. And what they did, they asked people questions um, where the answer was always yes, but they measured the reaction time. They measured how long it took people to answer yes. And the questions involved um, statements where the uh, answer involved um, moving over several levels or staying on the same level. So for example, if the people were asked, do birds move? They had to go all the way from bird to animal so, so if, yeah, from bird to animal, so they had to go on one level up where moves were stored as a property before they could say yes. Um, if they were asked, do canaries move, a kind of bird, 
they had to go up two levels. They had to go from canary to bird to animal. And sure enough, that took longer for people to say yes. However, the last question, if you look at that, are canaries yellow? Took very little time because yellow is specific for canary birds, for only canaries. So the reaction time varied, was slow, longer or slower, depending on how many levels, how many nodes had to be traversed to access the information in our mental lexicon. So this was a fantastic experiment and everybody said, wow, this is great. Um, however, if you look a little closer, there are some problems like with many experiments. Um, first of all, um, certain members of a category are more typical than others. So canary is a very typical bird and robin is also a typical bird. So you may um, access information about that bird faster than about a, word you don't, a bird you don't really know very well, or a member of the category. Uh, related is the frequency. We know from many, many independent experiments that the more frequently we hear or encounter a word, the faster it comes to our mind and the faster we use it. So again, uh, words like birds, in this case, like Robin, are faster than canary or maybe peacock or something. Um, second or third, um, how big is the category? How many um, kinds of, in this case, again, birds does a speaker has to look through before they think about canary and retrieve the important uh, information? And finally, and you may have thought about this already when you looked at this picture, um, the distance between the levels is not really the same. The further you go down, the distance from the level to the next higher one um, is smaller and the next bigger one is very large. So it's the meaning distance, right? So salmon and um, fish is not such a big distance. They're quite intuitively quite similar, but fish and animal is a very large jump, right? So um, these were uh, legitimate critiques of this model, but nevertheless, the model is pretty reasonable. And this model inspired WordNet, and we said, okay, this is very cool, but um, how would that actually look on a large scale? Because Collins and Quillians just looked at these birds and the fish and uh, made big statements. And we say, how would it look if we actually looked at most of the English lexicon? So um, then we started to build WordNet and um, we, it was built by hand, which today people wouldn't do anymore. Many WordNets are built in other languages, same idea, but other languages semi-automatically or fully automatically, but we did it all by hand. So where did we get the data from to make these trees, these structures, this network, right? Well, one is we looked at psycholinguistic psycho evidence from association norms. Associations are a very, very simple test that uh, psychologists often do with people to see um, all kinds of things, whether they're mentally healthy, what they think about, whether they are worried about something or what's on their mind. So you can tell people, what comes to your mind when I say hand? Most people will say finger and arm. Almost everybody says, some people say leg. Uh, what comes to your mind if I say um, rodent at the bottom there? People will say rat because a rat is a kind of rodent. Now, these kind of association norms spontaneously answers to a stimulus, a word that people are given, have been collected thousands and thousands and thousands of them in databases. And you can look this up and you can see what kind of words most people associate with a stimulus. And interestingly, um, uh, the, the first response is the most very, very frequent one. And then a uh, few responses are given by few people. So it's very robust. And most people make the same one or two associations. And these associations are very often category members um, or in the case of adjectives, opposites. So when I say hot, everybody says cold. If I say cold, everybody says hot. So opposition, autonomy, is another very, very strong organization in our mental lexicon among words. We also looked at speech errors when people substitute a word that they don't intend to use. So here's one that I always make. I always mix up the uh, words for time periods. So I always say week for day, and this is very common or day for months, very, very common. Again, think of the library, I pull out the wrong book. Very closely related, but 
wrong. Um, we can also look at priming. Priming is something that uh, those of you in psychology may be familiar with. It is a, um, an experimental paradigm that is used for many, many particular kinds of experiments. And it's very simple. Um, you put people in front of a computer screen and you show them a string of letters in their language. Uh, and sometimes the string of letters is a real word. And sometimes it's not a real word. It's just, it could be a word, but it doesn't exist. And then you ask people, press a button, whether it's a word or not, uh, either yes or no button on, this, on their keyboard. And of course, people can do that. Everybody who knows the language can do that. Um, but what you're interested in is how long it takes people to press the button. In particular, if they're shown a word that is related in meaning to a word that they have seen a little while before. So if you show them the word nurse and you have shown them the word doctor um, a little bit before, people will press the yes button much, much faster than if they see nurse and they've seen apple, let's say. So again, this has been done thousands and thousands of time. it's very, times. It's very robust. And it shows again that if we are already in a certain semantic space, the doctor or hospital or medical semantic space, then we can find the word nurse much faster than we find the word, say, apple. Um, so this, and again, there is a lot of data on these experiments where you can actually look and see which words people uh, react to faster. Um, okay, so as I said, people turn press the yes button faster when they have been primed, when they're already in the semantic space as of um, a given in a given category. Awesome. All right, so we have all these uh, evidences, bits of evidence for WordNet that we used in order to build our uh, network. Now, two problems that every language, or not problems, properties, I should say, that every language had that we had to deal with, uh, synonymy and polysemy. Synonymy, of course, where you have uh, several words that have the same meaning, and polysemy, where you have one word, but many meanings. So the two are kind of mirror images, if you want. And WordNet has to account for that, or any dictionary has to account for that. So uh, the way we build WordNet is that every node in this network, remember these networks I showed you, is what we call a concept. And that concept can be expressed by several different word forms, by several different words. Those are synonyms. So here are examples. Beat, hit, and strike in English are synonyms. Car, motor car, auto, automobile, so big and large, queue and line, and so forth. So each of these is one of these dots, or one of these circles, or one of these nodes in the network. Uh, the members uh, follow no particular order, doesn't matter which one comes first. Um, then polysemy, the other way around, namely that one word can have many meanings, is represented in a way that the given word, in this case table, um, occurs in four different places in the lexicon. So one table occurs like a graph, right, tabular array, one part of the lexicon, one synonym set, one dot, one circle. The other one, the piece of furniture, appears somewhere else. A table, a mesa, is a geographic formation, appears somewhere else. And the verb table, to postpone, again, appears somewhere else. So that's how WordNet deals with synonymy, members of a uh, concept, and polysemy, different concepts, but the same word form. So you can think of it that way, polysemy this way, and um, now where comes the net part in? Well, the net of WordNet, so far we've talked about the words, is the interconnection uh, among the these um, nodes. Um, we have re um, thought about relations, semantic relations that connect them, arcs or lines. And um, for those of you who are computer scientists, you have a directed acyclic graph. Um, uh, where did we get them from, these relations? Well, we looked already at ancient Greek philosophers who talked about categorization and Aristotle in particular, 
who talked about the is a relation, the is a kind of relation. He said, you can organize many concepts in the world by saying X is a kind of Y. And also, secondly, you can organize many concepts by saying X has a kind of Y. So a dog has a tail and so forth. So these two relations, the is a relation and the has a relation, are what we used to link these nodes in the con in the network, these circles or these synsets, sets of synonyms, to one another. Uh, nowadays, this was not the case when we started uh, in, in the almost more than thirty years ago with WordNet. Um, nowadays, you can also look at large text, digital text sets, um, and you can look which words co-occur in um, the same space that you define the same sentence or the same document or maybe even just the same pair of words and you can see that uh, meaningfully related words are used together in the same um, context so table and furniture this one kind of table are used together uh, table and graph or array the other sense of table are used together uh, in close fairly close proximity in different documents so um, um, there is modern evidence as well for semantic similarity and semantic similarity of a particular kind. So we built WordNet and here's a tiny, tiny, tiny example again. Um, there's a little tree from WordNet. You have vehicle on top. Then you have a le the next level, the synonyms kind automobile or bicycle and bike. And then you have more specific cars or more specific bicycles on the lower level. And this allows you to say, if you're a learner, suppose you don't know English and you look at SAP and you say, oh, now I know that the car is the kind of vehicle because of this relationship. And I also know that the kind of, the class of cars includes, the car category includes convertibles and SUVs, for example. Right? So in real life, on real WordNet, these hierarchies, these tree structures can be up to 16 deep. There is getting very specific and very abstract at the top. Um, we started with about a dozen high level concepts like person, animal, artifact, and so forth. And they all link to a single root. So the tree has one single top node or root node, which we called entity. And that was important for computer scientists because they want to measure the distance from any concept to any other concept and they need to travel in this tree, sometimes via the highest node, the single highest node entity. Um, WordNet also has, here's an example, right? A very, again, just a toy example, but you can go, if you look on the left from carrot all the way to entity, and you could ask, oh, how similar are carrot and birdcage on the right? Well, of course, they're not very similar. We know this intuitively. But you can actually express this quantitatively by saying how many arcs, how many pointers, how many uh, relations do I have to transverse to get all the way from carrot, all the way to object, back down to birdcage. Well, it's a lot, right? So that shows you that carrot and birdcage are not very meaningfully related. Um, but carrot and um, plant, Oh, let's see, a plant organ, I guess it's actually don't have a plant here, right, are pretty close because they only need a very short trip from one to the other. Again, this is just a, a toy example. The real world that it's much bigger and more complicated, but it's just to give you the idea. Um, categories, of course, are culture specific. So not every language would construct the same kind of tree. So uh, George Lakoff, the linguist at Berkeley, um, who looked at Yirmal, which is an um, indigenous language in Australia, he wrote a famous book called Women, Fire and Dangerous Things. And if you look at this book, you say, what's funny title, Women, Fire and Dangerous Things? Well, because in Yirmal, in this language, in the speakers of this language, group women, fire and dangerous things together in one category. So feminists, take note. <laughs> um, so we have the is a kind of relation in WordNet, but we also have the part whole relationship like has a. So a car has an engine, at least the old fashioned kind of cars, and they have cylinders and spark plugs and so forth. 
Um, again, you can inherit from, you can go all the way down or all the way up, depending on how you travel in this network. Um, I'm skipping this in the interest of time. Um, adjectives are a little bit different. Um, adjectives don't have the is a kind of relationship, but rather um, we know that adjectives are organized by antonymy. We have very strong associations between opposite words. I already said hurt and cold, old and new, high and low, big and small. They're all used with the same head nouns. So again, if you measure, if you want to measure computationally uh, their difference uh, via context, you will find that they are actually the same. And young children at a very small age think that hot and cold mean the same thing or old and new. And only until they experience something do they realize the two are opposites. Um, <clears throat> so BirdNet groups adjectives together in terms of these um, opposite relationships. Basically, the model is like this. Uh, if you have, we have core words like dry and wet opposites, and then we have many, many other adjectives, of course, which are not quite as strongly associated in our minds, but which are related to the concept, like soggy for wet or arid for dry. And WordNet, this is just a model, a representation, um, represents this in terms of the direct antonyms, dry and wet, long and short, um, wide and narrow, and um, indirect, so-called indirect antonyms. Um, okay. Um, Alina, you have to tell me how much time I have. I'm skipping over some slides, but I have many more and I can, maybe we leave time for questions. Yeah, well, it would be so, so nice to leave some time for the discussion. Yeah, okay. Permission. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so we did an experiment actually, um, where we asked people, um, is soggy the opposite of dry? And we again measured the reaction time and people would say yes, but it took a certain amount of time. If he said, is wet the opposite of a dry, it took much less time. If he said, is soggy the opposite of arid, people sort of scratched their head and thought about it. And then they said, yeah, I guess so. But it took a really long time. So again, reaction time uh, seemed to reflect the way we looked up, so to speak, in our mental lexicon, these concepts and uh, made judgments about them. Okay, um, I'm not going to say much about verbs because in the interest of time. Um, but um, if anybody have any questions, I will ask you about this. Um, so, um, yeah, so let me um, jump ahead a little bit. Um, the, you, of course, know that neuroscience is a very active field these days, and we can now look into the brain uh, without uh, cutting people up or waiting till they have died and see what's going on in their brain. We can use um, magnetic resonance imaging, in particular functional magnetic resonance imaging, by giving people some kind of task, like a word to think about, and see where in the brain um, the air, what lights up, what is active in the brain, what gets more oxygen or blood supply. Um, and uh, there is a paper that appeared in 2012 and has been followed up actually by a more recent work uh, at the University of Texas. Uh, where the ex uh, people took uh, 1,700 objects and action categories from WordNet and um, gave these to people in the scanner, in the machine, and looked where uh, the, in the brain things slid up. And lo and behold, what we found, what they found, was uh, a lot of support for WordNet. So let's just look at one part here. Uh, for example, um, we can look at the... Um, uh, upper right, uh, upper right, sort of a little bit to the right, we can see talk and communicate closely together. These were brain areas that lit up together very closely, and WordNet would talk, put talk and communicate very closely together. Um, or let's say, um, if you look at um, um, uh, travel on the left, travel, if you show people words like um, gallop, uh, on a horse or rappel on a mountain or walk on earth, right? Walk on ground. A uh, very similar area of the brain that is activated when people are stimulated with these words. So there was a lot of support for the WordNet organization simply by looking at people's brains and saying, what is activated when we give them this word to think about? 
Um, here are some statistics from WordNet. Uh, you can see that most of these are nouns. Um, then only 10% of, uh, of these are verbs, um, adjectives uh, more, or adjectives and adverbs very few and the total number of word forms of distinct words in WordNet are 155,000, so that's a lot. And these are organized in these clusters of synonyms uh, to altogether about uh, 118,000. So you can download the WordNet uh, database if you want. Computer scientists often do that and uh, see uh, what's going on there and use it possibly for some experiment. Um, uh, now, in particular, WordNet has been used for an important task in natural language understanding, uh, namely, how do uh, I can auto how can I automatically understand uh, or discriminate the meaning difference between um, table the graph and table the piece of furniture? Well, uh, you can do it precisely as I showed you earlier by looking, traversing, traveling in this graph. Um, by looking how far uh, one table in the in your context where the word table appears and you don't know which table it is, whether there is furniture somewhere in that context, and then you say, ah, counting the number of arcs between furniture and one table, and I come to the table that means a piece of furniture. But if, if somewhere else in your context of the word table is graph or array or computer science or data or something like that, then you can measure the difference between those words and the other table and see that it's much smaller. So it's got to be that table and not the piece of furniture. So this is a very simple approach to disambiguating words with multiple meanings automatically and in enhancing, improving the automatic understanding of text. Because polysemy, the fact that words have multiple meanings, is still a major problem in automatic understanding of text. And of course, that's important for machine translation, language learning, any kind of textual processing, right? Um, okay, um, WordNet is my last slide. Um, WordNet is also useful um, to help people with dementia or anomia, a condition where people cannot retrieve words. So WordNet has been used and in fact paid for um, uh, with an application has been paid for with um, federal grants, medical grants. Um, if people uh, typically cannot remember uh, words in a given category like hammer or tool, we give them a one word and then link them to other related words to stimulate their memory. Um, and that can be again done automatically with a tool that leads them to a category and all the members of the category that they have either forgotten or have trouble um, accessing the, the verbal labels for. Um, and finally, psycholinguistic, psycholinguists need data for priming for this um, kind of experiment that I showed you earlier. And they often use WordNet and they say, hey, give me related words that I can then use for my uh, psycholinguistic experiment. Um, so this was, um, I rushed a little bit, but I hope I gave you a little bit of an um, idea of what WordNet is, how it was inspired. Uh, how it was, how it is designed, and what it can be used for, and that it's not just something we thought up in our offices here at Princeton, our laboratories, but something that actually um, relates to what other disciplines like psychology and neuroscience uh, are doing and have been doing, and um, that um, it can help us understand the human mind a little bit. So thanks for listening, and I'm very happy to take questions. Um, and I will end my show here. Dear Christian, thank you so much for this fascinating talk. For this, it, is, it was so thought provoking. It's, it, I, I'm still plunged into it. Thank you so much, as much of our audience, I'm sure. So, such an amazing interdisciplinary field with, with such great contacts with psychology, medicine, neuroscience probably neurosurgery as well. That was one of my questions, if you permit. Dear audience, we've had such an amazing talk. Do you have questions? The floor is all yours. Our fantastic lecturer is all ready to, to, to get involved into a vivid discussion. Do we have some, some questions? Шановна аудиторія, будь ласка, така стимулююча до розділу, до роздумів і всіляких обговорень лекція. Може, у вас з'явилися вже перші запитання? 
Бо наша лекторка, професорка Фелбаума, готова на них відповісти. Шановна Євгенія Сергійовна, дуже I дякую have... вам. Can I put a question, please? Yes, please, Ms. Kennedy. Dear Professor, in your opinion, could the ancient languages, classical languages, languages like um, ancient Greek, Latin, be useful in some way in these modern researchers of what uh, network? We, 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 there are not owners of these languages now, we have just texts. So what can we do with this? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. That's a very good question. Um, WordNet, after we built the English WordNet, has been um, built, uh, copied, and I don't mean this in a negative sense of copy, uh, re reinvented <laughs> in many other languages, including Greek and Latin, ancient Greek and Latin, um, because people, again, wanted to see whether, first of all, this model of this very simple model of a network of a graph uh, can be applied to languages that, as you put very well, we don't own anymore. Um, and or whether they have a completely different structure, whether the categories are the same. Um, and uh, finally, also for tools that have some of the applications that I mentioned earlier for understanding of uh, Greek text. So again, just to see if there is a word that we don't, whose meaning we don't really know anymore so well, or uh, hapax legomenon, right? The word that only occurs once, and we really don't quite know what it means. Um, look at the surrounding words and uh, see whether the surrounding context um, is related in some way and could be related to this word in a meaningful way that sheds some light on it, right? So, um, yes, and surely, as I said, some languages, not, I think, ancient Greek and Latin so much since they're Indo-European languages, but completely different languages would make completely different word nets. So I, I am in touch with a colleague who studies um, an American indigenous language uh, in the Cree family in Canada. And she said, there are no categories. And I said, I can't believe that. <laughs> and she said, no, everything is just a flat list. If you ask people, you show them a basket and a box and a bag, and you said, what, what do they have in common? What is the category? Now, you and I would say container, for example, right? Something like that. But she says, they, they say, no, we don't see any category here. So I'm still arguing with her. I find that difficult to believe, <laughs> but um, it's possible. So there's a very interesting field still open for research uh, where we can... Uh, see whether this model is really universally applicable. Does it really say something about the human mind or whether it's just English or Indo-European specific? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was so interesting to hear about the universal applications of the of the mm. project. Do we do we have more questions, dear audience? Шановна аудиторія, чи є в нас ще запитання? With your kind permission. Of course, Dear Christian, I yes. had uh, so many, so many uh, different associations while you were. Oh, uh, Igor Alexandrovich, yes. Alaska, would you please? I will, I will definitely. Uh, first of all, all yours, uh, my question was: What are the applications of what you're doing? But you have answered, and I am completely satisfied. Uh, the other uh, comment is that uh, uh, sometimes uh, I try to keep in mind uh, in my memory uh, the name of my new acquaintance um, we are uh, association like uh, if uh, his name is uh, Sergei Alexander Alexander Sergeyevich <laughs> then I uh, Pushkin well he is Pushkin he is not Pushkin but just association with uh, this uh, writer or once my uh, it was difficult for me to keep in my memory uh, cemetery, but uh, my student uh, helped me. It is just a, as in Ukrainian uh, Zwinter, then just does the same. But my question is uh, the following. As far as it is my opinion, I'm not sure that it is truly so. However, uh, there are different manners of writing uh, between European uh, languages and Chinese. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you see uh, some application of this difference or explanation of this difference? 
They, uh-huh. they do not use letters, they use uh, yeah, hieroglyphs. Uh, yes, yes, uh, yes, um, or logographs. Yes, absolutely. Let me actually make, before I answer that, let me just come back to your um, very interesting um, mention of names. Names are, of course, special words, right? Names are very different from, pro- these are proper nouns, very different from common nouns. They have different linguistic properties. We can't say Z. We don't say Z Pushkin, right? You, I, I don't Russian, you don't, Ukrainian, you don't say the at all, right? Um, and uh, it's also interesting that we forget them first as we get a little older and we forget them most easily. So they don't seem to be part of this network. They don't really, not, not, WordNet can't deal with them. And we as speakers who forget the names have to build our own little WordNets or relational network, right? So we have to say, ah, Pushkin, okay, maybe... Um, Yevgenia uh, and um, or something, right? We have it's another common name, <laughs> but we have to have some kind of. Uh, so that's tricky. So I just want to say that um, you're right in bringing that up is a problem, and unfortunately, WordNet doesn't have an answer for that. Um, as to your second question, um, WordNet is um, not concerned so much with writing systems. There are Chinese WordNets, in fact, several Chinese WordNets, several Chinese colleagues, different groups have built WordNets, and they have mostly used Pinyin, which is the um, transcription of the logographs into with Roman letters, right? The way more or less phonetic spelling, uh, and then they have built a WordNet like a WordNet for Chinese. Um, maybe what you're asking, and that's a very interesting question, is that the characters also show, um, uh, most words are really two, two characters and two meanings, right? And two different components in there, two radicals. Um, do you mean that? Or you're shaking your head and you're nodding? I'm not sure. <laughs> so that also may show something about the internal structure of words, right? Um, and that's something that in English we don't really deal with so i would defer to my chinese colleagues there but chinese as i said chinese colleagues have built a word net using not the chinese traditional script but the pinyin the roman roman letters and that well, thank, you. Thank, the you. thank you hmm? uh, thank I, you dear christian we've got uh, one more question dear yeah. marta you're most welcome thank you uh, thank you uh, hello thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask about this experiment uh, where uh, you uh, asked people to give like this free associations to the word. And uh, you mentioned that you tested like ment- uh, people without like mental health uh, issues. And uh, mm-hmm. uh, I'd like to ask about uh, if we uh, ask people uh, with mental health issues who has like this logical um, um, some like um, problems because of the disease just in the state. So will like this uh, schemes of associations differ from the ones uh, who like doesn't, to, who don't uh, have uh, mental health uh, diseases? Yeah, thank you. That's a very important question. Um, so this um, uh, little experiment or this, this um, procedure of word association is actually very old. It's at least 100 years old. Um, and people have done it in many countries uh, with many population, men, women, children, old, young, um, and also people with mild um, mental health um, impairments. And uh, as a result, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of uh, such data available and databases. And as I mentioned, most of them show there is a norm. In fact, these books, I have it right here, I can look at it. It's called Norms of Word Association. So they are norms. They show uh, what thousands of people have said, and they are almost always the same. And so you use that as a baseline if you want to test somebody. If I'm a psychiatrist, which of course I'm not, and somebody comes uh, referred to me as a patient with a mental health issue, I may give them such a test and I can see how they differ from the norm. And then I use that as a baseline to make a diagnosis. Um, But there are norms, especially for people with a mild mental illness. If people are very severely ill, then it's very difficult to uh, maybe come up with a diagnosis. But interestingly, the mild um, mental diagnosis are quite similar to people who are uh, mentally healthy. And those are used as a baseline to measure how serious ill somebody else is um so you may you may even i'm you may have done this as a 
child. When I tell, teach my students about this, they say, oh, we were tested in school this way, in grade school even. The teacher came and said, tell me what comes to your mind when I say hot. And all these little kids say cold, right? Or something like that. So <laughs> uh, this is something that is so simple. And But it's good because it's been done thousands and thousands of times. And we have a good way of knowing quantitatively um, what to expect. And if we find something that is not expected, then we have to look and see and there may be a problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Marcia. And so, yeah, yes, it's a super important question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. If you permit, dear Christian, a little question of mine. I've had so many associations while you were talking, and the first one was actually with fuzzy sets uh, proposed by George Lakoff in his ah. Hedges uh, study in meaning criteria, which actually was one of my first linguistic discoveries because uh -huh. my uh -huh. research was related to that and penguin being sort of a bird, but not completely a bird. Mm -hmm. And uh, secondly, when you've mentioned this, um, uh, dim, um, like uh, people mostly forgetting such words as tools, uh, suffering from dementia yeah, in organization of their lexical memory. Mm -hmm. uh, I remembered there was this uh, film uh, illustrating the early onset of Alzheimer's. I think it was, if I'm not uh -huh. mistaken, still Alice. It was the uh -huh. title of it. Oh, uh, where true. like oh. an academic started suffering from Alzheimer's disease and this whole process was shown from inside. So my question was, uh, do you think that there is any like maybe immediate cooperation, maybe any kind of, because you've mentioned, since you've mentioned that application of this uh, project with medicine in terms of research of dementia, or even I would say brain surgery, because I know that some operations are being performed with people um, being uh, not completely uh, unconscious uh, when they are asked actually to yes. name some of the words uh, being presented with pictures, yeah? And mm -hmm. probably there is a very um, big potential for a cooperation between these fields, yeah? Mm -hmm. Of your project. Yes. Mm -hmm. Different medical directions, yeah? Thank you yes, so much. Yes, Most yes absolutely. Yes, I, I agree. And thanks for bringing this up. And as you, of course, know, uh, a brain surgery doesn't hurt, right? So you can actually, or you can, uh, you can, people are awake during brain surgery, right? Yes, yes. And as you say, you can ask them questions. And I have a colleague who does this. Uh, and one of the things you can also do, you know, that is to um, uh, paralyze momentarily one part of the brain and then just look at the one that's still active and see, hey, what's going on there, right? Um, yes, so, but I think one has to distinguish between uh, research and dis discovery of important um, uh, things going on and uh, remediation or medical treatment. So um, other than what I mentioned earlier, I'm not aware, and of course, I, many things I don't, just don't know and I can't follow everything. I'm not aware of WordNet being used um, in a therapeutic way, other than the tool that I mentioned earlier by people with mild dementia gets stimulated to think about a certain category and get uh, presented. And that interfaces with images. So you can teach people, some people learn via images, you can show them the image of say tools. They are very Im highly imageable, they're not abstract. Um, and you can teach them to associate or reassociate the word and to make the connections among words. Um, that's of course not for serious Alzheimer's. And um, I do not know of any, and I'm, but I know there isn't a lot of optimism to assume that um, people who have Alzheimer's, which is very progressive, uh, can be uh, treated to recover uh, part of their uh, verbal functioning and of their mental lexicon. So I, I hope so, but I'm not aware of it. And uh, uh, so I think at the moment we are mostly still in the discovery stage and in the study stage. And that's the first stage to doing something about and helping people, right? Um, but we still need to learn more and uh, new technology is fortunately uh, available. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That sounds very promising. That sounds very promising area. Thank you so much. Yes, yes, yes. Are you, if I may ask, are you a neuroscientist or neuro, neuro linguist? Or? Uh, not, not really, but I was interested in that part and I read a lot about that and yeah. witnessed some of the operations being performed like oh, that. You did. Oh, good. Oh, you're a tough girl. I would faint. <laughs> wanted to be a surgeon at some point of my life. 
I see. Thank ah. you so much. Uh, but actually, let me say something else, if I may. Uh, you brought up Lake of Fuzzy Sets. Yeah, so this is a yes. shortcoming of WordNet, right? Because WordNet is sort of absolute, and it says this is a word, and that's its meaning, right? Um, but the synonym sets somewhat take care of the fact that there are clearly, there are clearly differences between the members of the synset. They're not all the same. So we use car sometimes, and automobile we use in other contexts, right? And this is something where contextual studies, studies of the context of large databases can shed light on it's very subtle meaning differences. Um, and uh, you also pointed out correctly, uh, and people always, when I give them more time, they say, oh, wait a minute, when I show them this tree with Collins and Love to say that penguins don't fly. <laughs> so absolutely, yes. So they are, uh, they are, we usually assign them to that category, but they're not really, they don't really share all the properties. So to do it very, very cleanly, one would have to, um, yeah, add some more features into WebNet. You're absolutely right. Um, so we, we cheat a little bit there, yeah, sometimes, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Dear audience, do we have more questions? Um, I, on, on your behalf, I would like to thank our dear presenter for everything and mostly for this fantastic hour and for your amazing support that we feel here. And as Evgenia Sergeyevna just mentioned, yeah, for this agreement to come and for being with us in such hard times, for supporting Vasil Karazin Kharkiv National University that has not relocated and keeps working with this rectorate and the deans and deputy deans and heads of departments and um, in such hard times, shaping its way to Victoria's Day. So we are most grateful for that. And we, we, we very much hope to see you in person and yes. to welcome you Thank in you. our alma mater, with it, with, with, in, on our premises yeah, in Kharkiv on a Victoria's yes. Day or shortly after it. It would be such a great honor to meet you once again. We hope to stay in contact, in scientific context, in terms of conferences, symposia, and all the possible links that might occur will be immediately forwarded to you and likewise. Yes, well, thank you very, very much. It was a big honor for me. And uh, I can only say you are heroes and I really admire your carrying on in these difficult times. And uh, let's hope they'll pass soon and um, do be in touch. And those of you who didn't ask questions but may have questions, please don't be shy. I'm reading email all the time. Shoot me an email and I'm very happy to answer or send you a paper or if you have any critical thoughts, I'm very receptive to that. Please um, stay in communication and whatever I can do to support you um, from the long distance, um, let me know. And uh, all good wishes to you. Thank you, dear Christian. Шановна аудиторія, пані пані професорка Фелбаум, дякує нам за таку зустріч. Вона каже, що ви герої, і це дійсно так. Я хочу сказати, що усі контакти, які будуть потрібні, будуть передані відповідним факультетам, нашим шановним деканам. Дуже прошу вас писати. Пані Фелбаум буде чекати на ваші листи і буде відповідати на ваші запитання, якщо вони виникнуть, і буде рада встановлення контактів між факультетом і Принстонським університетом. І також від душі хочу подякувати шановних деканів Євгенія Сергійовна, Ігор Олександрович, шановний професор, шановні наші професори, Людмила Васильівна Солощук, дуже дякую вам за вашу присутність, дуже дякую вам, колеги, за те, що ви знаходите у собі мужність і час приділяти увагу цим зустрічам. Шановний центр, шановний центр зв'язків з громадськістю, шановні, шановні колеги, дякую вам за вашу повседневну роботу, без якої жодна з цих зустрічей не мала б місце. Це велика честь працювати з вами. Dear Christian, I just thanked my dear colleagues, our deans present today, our respected professors and our public relations center, you know, for their amazing support of the, what we are doing and Hopefully, there will be more lectures to come, many more. I hope so too. Yeah, and it's lovely Thank to you so much. All, and, uh, all good wishes. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank Bye. you so much. Bye. 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 Bye.